I worked the day through. By the end of the second week, I was adjusted to the labor, and the workers gave up on hazing me. Once or twice, my friend would see me walking and give me a lift in. We had weekends off if we chose them. I worked. I found out that I was making minimum wage, which at the time was three thirty-five an hour. Weekends were overtime. If I worked the maximum, I would pull down around two forty a week after taxes. The Indians charged me twenty dollars a week for rent. I survived on food from the station, mostly orange juice and fruit and candy bars. I bought a battery power clock with an alarm at a drugstore. In bed by nine, up at three. Walking to work took an hour. Into my second week, I was allowed to ride to and from the site with the boys and the pickups, and that gave me two extra hours a day. My sister in Illinois offered to bail me out, but I couldn't take her money. I hated the work more and more, but I felt a bond with the desert, with the deadliness of it. At night, I would write in my journal and fall asleep with no trace of sound around me. And I tried to take a weekend off, but I fell bored with everything and went back to the ditch. Payday was once every month, pay to the day the checks were issued. And I started the job on the third day of the new pay period. I came to stand at peace with the Navajos, though we hated each other. I was a symbol of war and death and dominance to them. To me, they were just more assholes I had to see every day in order to make money. They were no different to me than anyone else. I wasn't responsible for their holocaust. I wasn't even alive. They dealt with me the way someone deals with a fly they cannot kill. I found a nice mindset out in the desert with the job, the boys, the heat, the nothingness. It would do me no good to bitch about it or take pity on myself. There was no time for it. I was a vessel for that cable, for the phone company. I took it. I had no choice. One day on the job, one of the Indians dug too carelessly and broke open one of the lower cables. They were fiber optic lines from the phone company. I learned through another laborer's broken English and hand movements that if you shined a flashlight through one end of a 5,000 foot section, the light would come out of the other end. He had said it was expensive to repair, something like 400,000 a minute or an hour or whatever he'd meant for a specialist to come out. We were laying a different type of line next to the fiber optic that was already in the ground. The guy hit it and cut it open with the shovel. He was called off the line. Work was halted for a few hours. And I never saw him again. I remember it because he tried to point the finger at me. I was working in front of him. And he was scared. He called the foreman over and nodded at me. White boy cut wire. I looked at the foreman and shook my head. I kept digging. The worker tried to come at me, but I stopped him with my shovel, laid it hard across his shins. Another Indian stepped in and defended me to the boss, an Indian I'd never talked to. I didn't know why he did it. I guess I had earned a shred of respect out there. I was out of myself there, in a certain zone, a haze. Even nailing the Indian with my shovel was in careless slow motion. Everything that happened out there only drifted by with little or no importance. Everything that happened was secondary to the ditch. Payday came. I hadn't showered in just a few days under a month, save washing off with the hose at the station. My check was pathetic compared to the work I had done. My rent was $80. That with the money I owed in the van would leave me with 60 extra. I would leave with a little under what I'd rolled in with. After everyone got their checks, they had to go back to work. I walked off the site and into town to cash in. Back at the station, the boss opened the register. I told him to get the wheels on before I paid him. What, you don't trust us? I didn't say anything. He nodded at me. Half the money first. No. He'll put the wheels on. I'll watch you. Just put the fucking wheels on. He whistled to the worker. That's how they called each other. That whistle. I was utterly sick of that whistle. Out back, 
he removed the jacks one by one after the wheels were bolted down. They surrounded me. I dug into my pocket and pulled the money out. They eyed the roll. I held my hand out. The keys. Now. The boss dropped the keys into my hand. I peeled off 980 and handed it to him. He looked at me squarely and walked away. His worker followed him and he watched the money over his shoulder. I fired up the Dodge and pulled out, feeling more indifferent than anything. I headed down the same back roads. I stopped in Tucson. Downtown there was some sort of carnival. I was rugged and dark. I fit right in. For the first time in my life, I wanted a beer. The compulsion came from nowhere, hit me from above. The first barmaid asked for ID, so I went next door. The place was dark and seedy. I sat in the back. It was a dismal bar. The barmaid didn't sweat me about my age, and I ordered my first beer. I stayed in the bar all night and wrote in my journal. After every glass, the words got better. They grew into characters trading lines. I wrote my first pages of short story dialogue, my first poems. After a few more, I couldn't write. Only four men had entered the bar the whole night. After last call, I floated to my van and fell asleep. Chapter 3 I awoke heavy and wet. My head was full. It wasn't like the small headaches I had gotten from the wine in the past. No, there was weight to this one. Every small noise was amplified grossly. I could remember the old woman bringing me beer constantly. I pissed next to one of my wheels, watching the sunrise. I could hear it rising, crackling. I found my shirt. At a gas station, I bought some aspirin and washed them down. Up the highway, at a Denny's, I drank coffee and got ready to read the journal. It was nice and cool in there. I looked out and saw my van. My head was still pounding from the beer. I felt sick and remorseful for drinking as much as I drank, but I also felt a little proud. I read the drunken pages. After I forced down breakfast, I had a bike shop and got my bike squared away with a tube and new tires. Thirty-five dollars, over ten hours of digging. I watched my hands as I flipped through the bills. They were darker, larger and hardened, carved throughout with veins and drying cuts another feeling of pride. I drove from New Mexico back to Phoenix automatically, not even thinking about it. Another summer was over, but late September was still murder. At my sister's, a large white van was parked on the side of her house. I walked in without knocking. She wasn't anywhere around, and I didn't see the kids. One of my brothers sat at the table with his wife, my second oldest brother. I had flashes of him and his wife popping in and out of our lives once in a while when I was a boy. He was notorious in the family for burning everyone for money and consistently breaking his promises. I hadn't seen him for nearly four years, since the funeral, when he and his wife were living in a different van and running cons across the country. They stayed with us for a month, ran up some heavy bills, then he started a convenient fight with my father and they roared off to fuck somebody else for a while. If you were around him long enough, you could smell bridges burning behind his back. He didn't get up when he saw me. He shook my hand from the table. His wife sat there and made bad jokes. I stepped outside with him while he lit up. Not a minute into his cigarette, he asked me to trade him vans. I told him to forget it. He'd been in and out of jail a lot. He was talking about moving back to Peoria, he worked construction and roofing his whole life. If someone couldn't do anything for him, they didn't exist. But I didn't quite hate him because I never quite knew him. They'd been sleeping in the van outside for the last two weeks. He said they were pulling out because he didn't like my sister's new boyfriend. And it threw me off. He told me the guy's name was Jimbo, and he'd driven down from Peoria, Illinois, to be with her. He told me the guy was an alcoholic. I smiled. Peoria did that to everybody, made them alcoholics. The phone rang. He told me to let it ring. I walked inside and answered, my sister calling from my father's new house. 
She wasn't expecting me to answer her phone. She asked me if I was all right. I asked her about the new house. She said he was remarried, he'd met some woman who had picked him up off the streets and brought him back to health, and he married her. I didn't say anything. She said the nutcase from Boulder City called him the day I left and told him what a bastard I was, and I started a fight between them. I could tell by her voice that she was worried about me finding out the truth of my birth. Everyone in the family knew but me. I saw their van pulling out of the driveway. That's weird. What's weird? Don and his shadow just took off without saying anything. He was supposed to leave me money on the table today. Do you see anything? I looked. I don't see anything. Surprise, surprise. Right. Well, I'll see him in a few more years, and like an idiot, I'll take him back in. Listen, I need to get cleaned up. Hang around for a while. I took a shower. In just under two months, my father was remarried and my sister had a guy living with her. I stretched out on the couch, watched television, and waited on my laundry. The phone rang. A recorded collect call from a penitentiary. If I accepted, I was not allowed to use third-party calling and the call would be monitored. I accepted because it was my nephew. He asked me where his mother was. I asked him what the fuck he was doing in prison. He said he had gotten popped for a petty theft twice, then a cop pulled his friend over while he was with him, found a bench warrant, and found a gun under the passenger seat. Was it your gun? No, but it wasn't his either. How long are you in for? Eight to sixteen months. Probably sixteen, though. You little dumbass. So where is she? We were cut off. I hung up. No sooner than I put it down, it rang again. My third brother, the cowboy. Hey, dude, you're back in town. I asked him what happened to Phoenix. He laughed. You leave and it goes all to hell. Straight to hell. He said he was doing better than ever. He landed a job sanding down the walls of new houses for the base coat, and they had a nice place now. He told me that if I needed somewhere to stay, I could stay there. I told him choose his words wisely, that I might take him up on them. That's cool, no skin off my ass. I thanked him for the visual and hung up before he could retaliate. It was nice to have some lightheartedness to balance such a destroyed return. I stayed the night with my sister and the girls. Her new guy was weird and quiet. He had a beer gut and a thick mustache. He was Peoria. He would leave her in three weeks. I parked in the back. He was right. It was better than their old place. Jenny had lost some weight and scored a job at a daycare where she could enroll their daughter for free. My place was the couch. I had given my sister a hundred bucks, so I was down to just under four hundred. My brother and I agreed that I would pay one hundred dollars a month. I paid for the first month. I spent the first week sleeping in until noon, driving to my sister's to swim, then riding my bike at night in the parking lot of a grocery store combining single tricks into long combinations. Then it was time to look for a goddamn job. I knew I couldn't deliver pizzas in the van quick enough to make any real money, like I used to in my four-speed, and gas would be a fucker. I bought a Sunday paper and wrote down a few numbers from the coffee table while my brother and his wife drank beer and listened to country music in the living room. A different Venice. At six in the morning, I was hired over the phone as a framer's assistant. The site was 20 minutes away. I bought a tool belt and some basic tools. Seven dollars an hour.